Minnesota, hello. Um, want to welcome you all to the Restore Your Shore workshop. Uh, my name is Angie Hong and I coordinate the East Metro Water Education Program, which is a local government partnership in the East Metro and Lower St. Croix area. Um, and just a little housekeeping, everybody always asks if I'm going to record. And yes, that was the sound. You should have got a little notification um, that I am recording the webinar tonight. So tomorrow I will send out an email to everybody with a link to where the recording is hosted and then also additional follow-up information and resources. So don't try not to get stressed out if you feel like you can't keep up with notes when Tom or Lori are presenting because we will send out resources and you can follow up with more questions after that. Um, and if you at any point in time have questions, just go ahead and type them in the chat. And I'm going to keep an eye on that and monitor and we'll just kind of pause periodically during the webinar tonight to answer questions. Um, you know, we can even at the end probably let people unmute yourself if you want to just have like an open talking kind of conversation as well. Um, but maybe try to keep it muted while the presenters are talking just so that we don't have background noise. Um, but do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat right now. It's kind of fun just to get to know one another and where we're all tuning in from. Um, and in terms of where, where will handouts be sent, everybody who registered should have registered with an email. So I'll just send out, send out a group email tomorrow that will have links to things. Um, okay. So then uh, let's... Give me one moment to make sure this little box moves out of the way so that you should be able to see the screen now without having the floating meeting panels in the way. Um, and we're going to kick off this presentation all about Restore Your Shore. And we can enjoy this beautiful view from the Chisago chain of lakes with a tiger swallowtail included just for scenic beauty. Um, all right, so we have three presenters tonight. I am kind of the, the starter and the closer. So I'm going to give us a little bit of framing for what our topic is. And then I'm gonna turn it over to two great experts that we have. Uh, Tom Langer is an aquatic ecologist with the Cornelia Marine St. Croix Watershed District. And he is primarily working with the district's Lakeshore Landowner Program. So this is really his area of expertise that he'll be talking about tonight. And then Lori Tella is a landscape architect with the Washington Conservation District. And she's got 15 years of experience working in conservation and landscape design. So she's going to be really good at providing some of those plant recommendations and landscape design recommendations as well. Okay, so just a little bit about who is hosting this workshop. Uh, we have a Lower St. Croix Watershed Partnership and an East Metro Water Education Program. And I'm showing on this map just kind of a shaded area of the geography where the local government partners are that are part of this partnership. Um, so we have 30 local government partners participating. And among this group, we have partners that can offer services like pre-site visits for landowners, cost share grants to offset the cost of planting projects or shoreline restoration projects. We put on a whole number of workshops and other educational programs throughout the year, and then have staff with expertise in lake and stream and river and wetland health, um, habitat restoration, landscape design, all sorts of different issues related to conservation. Um, but if you don't live in that area, don't feel bad because we are very well networked within the state of Minnesota. So if you're tuning in from another county, we can help to connect you with who the local resource is in your area also. Um, and then I just wanted to make note of the fact that if you're in Washington County in particular, it can get really confusing because we have a lot of watershed management organizations. Um, so Tom, who's talking today, is from this light purple area. This is the Carnelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District. Um, and some of the big lakes that you might know there are Big Marine, Big Carnelian, and Square Lake. Um, I did see that there was quite a few people also who were up kind of in this Forest Lake area. 
you're either in the Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District, if you're on Forest Lake, or if you're down on Clear Lake, then it's the Rice Creek Watershed District. So um, just to know that we'll, we'll help you figure that out on the back end if you don't already, already know what watershed you're in. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm, like I said, gonna kind of kick us off with an intro. Uh, Tom is gonna talk about how to assess the current condition of your shoreline, how to use the score your shore tool rules and regulations and local challenges and then Lori is going to talk about bioengineering plant selection site prep materials project installation those kinds of things um, and then i'll kind of close things up by talking about where to find expert assistance and grant support for these kinds of projects okay so just a little bit of framing for our topic tonight um, and I was telling you that Square Lake is my favorite lake, and this is a photo of Square Lake in the fall, which I think really perfectly illustrates why it is my favorite lake. It is one of these lakes that is known for having just crystal clear water, um, just a beautiful gem. It feels like being up north except close to the Twin Cities area. Um, in terms of water quality trends statewide, you can always log on to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's Impaired Waters Map to be able to learn about the water quality of lakes, rivers, and streams in your area. And I find it's a little stressful. Like when I look at it and I see this, there's a lot of red that kind of bums me out. Um, you know, lakes have all sorts of reasons. If they're red, they are impaired, um, but they have all sorts of different reasons that they might be listed as impaired. Um, so it could be anything from having too much phosphorus, so they get a lot of algae blooms in the summer. It's maybe the water's clear, but there is a mercury impairment in the fish. Um, so I like to instead focus on not the 2,904 impaired waters, although that is our mission is to fix that, um, but these ones, the purple ones, um, which are lakes, rivers, streams that we have successfully restored and delisted in the past um, 10 years or so. So that gives me hope that uh, in one moment, I got to see if there's a way that I can, maybe Tom or Lori, I think since you're co-hosts, you can probably mute people if there is um, people in the background. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so locally in Washington County, I know that our office does water quality monitoring on about 80 lakes in the area and we can say that about half of them actually have improving water quality. A lot of them are just holding steady at you know either low quality or high quality but a lot of them are getting better. Um, and we were lucky enough to be able to delist seven lakes just in this past year. Um, so these are just some snapshots of a few of the lakes that were able to be delisted and the one that I was most excited about, Stillwater Lily Lake, is one that the local community has actually been working for more than 20 years on water quality improvement projects to clean up that lake and finally was able to succeed and do that last year. So that was, that was a big yes, a big happy celebration. Um, another just kind of nice trend to note is that mercury levels for the first time ever are starting to fall in several Minnesota lakes. Um, and so mercury is a pretty big issue for Minnesota lakes in general. It's mostly coming from ap atmospheric deposition from things like coal burning power plants or other industrial processes. Um, but in 2020, 12 lakes, including Forest Lake, Tanner's Lake, and then Owasso and Joanna in the Twin Cities all were delisted um, because the mercury levels have fallen enough that they no longer have to issue fish consumption advisories on those lakes. So that is a good thing to celebrate as well. Um, a couple of the concerns that we have, one is just rising levels of chloride, a lot of that coming from winter road salt. So we're seeing more and more, it's only 54 lakes and streams impaired statewide, but it's really concerning when it does happen because we don't yet have any kind of technology to reverse it once it does. Um, and then the topic of tonight is loss of biodiversity due to shoreline alterations, which has emerged as a new concern in recent years. 
Um, and just this past year, Jane and Bone Lakes in Washington County were both listed as impaired for not having as much biodiversity as they used to. Um, and then the eight lakes in the Chicago chain of lakes were as well. And we've got Big Heart Island and Big Marine kind of listed as being at risk. So when we're looking at all of you, we're asking you to help us in this challenge to be able to preserve our Minnesota wildlife. Um, Tom and Lori are going to talk a lot about the impacts of shoreline development, but I always find that this um, graphic from University of Wisconsin Extension, Wisconsin DNR, is really useful um, at showing you the difference between, you know, an undeveloped shoreline, kind of a traditional small cabin shoreline, and a big house, how much that increases the amount of phosphorus, sediment, and runoff going into the lake. Um, we know that one pound of phosphorus translates into 500 pounds of algae. And we know that water quality can really dramatically affect property values. So having a three foot decrease in water clarity translates into a 22% decrease in property value. Um, and we know as well that when you own shoreline property, you're investing a lot of money in that shoreline property. You don't want to lose it. Um, but shoreline erosion can be a big problem, especially if you are mowing grass all the way down to the water and you don't have those deep roots to help hold the soil in place. Um, like I said, we know that the, the biodiversity, the, you know, the frogs, the birds, the fish, the turtles, this is the reason that you live on the lake. Like this is the Minnesota way of life that you, that you want. And so we want to work with you to help preserve it so it's there for, for you and for everyone else. Um, and just a last note before I turn things over to Tom is that 75% of the land in Minnesota is privately owned. So you, you personally, you play a really critical role in helping to protect Minnesota lakes. It's not something that we can do without the support of private landowners. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna turn things over to Tom and let you kind of take it away from there, all right? Yeah, perfect. Just confirm everybody can see my full screen. Yeah, great. Yep. Um, yeah, so again, uh, Angie got to introduce myself, so I won't go any further on that. I'll start on this slide. Um, I, I love this slide from the standpoint there's a lot going on, but if I draw your attention to the bottom right figure here, this aquatic lake zone, um, to me it just symbolizes what we're all after. Um, regulators, landowners, um, citizens who recreate in Minnesota, we all shared a common goal of clean, fishable, swimmable, recreatable waters. Um, and then I think this figure also speaks to how, how regulatory education, engagement, and when I say culture, I mean you as landowners really play a significant role in, in shaping the health of, of the aquatic ecosystem. Um, generally, you can think of regulatory and, and monitoring aspects um, in, in three different zones. You have your shoreland zone, your upland area. This is typically where your cabin, your home, um, your patios, your decks, that sort of thing exist. You have your shoreline, which is going to be the focus of tonight's discussion, um, and how that plays a critical link between the upland areas and the aquatic zone. Uh, as Angie's slide previously pointed out, this buffer area, this shoreline zone, plays a critical role in terms of habitat, nutrient sequestration, um, amongst other things. Um, uh, so, and then I'm what I'm going to focus on tonight is just laying some groundwork of of maybe some just high level trends, what we're seeing across the state and locally, but then from there dive into um, sharing some of the science. So again, I'm an aquatic ecologist by, by education and training. So um, I really understand the nuances of how to connect shoreline to the aquatic ecosystem. Um, and then in my current role, I work as a, a kind of in the permitting side to help assist landowners. So I'll, I'll share some of that with you as well. Um, but so to, to start off, I'd like to orient people to, um, when we're talking about shorelines, like what are we actually looking at and talking about here? And, and I like to start off with just showing these in terms of 
what are the different types of, of dominant shoreline types that we generally see? So here's what I would call natural shorelines. Um, these are shorelines characteristics of, of strong vegetation communities, maybe down woody debris. Um, but what you can see in these two images, they are different, but they're both dominated by natural. This top image here, um, uh, you can see lots of different grasses, wildflowers, um, perennial cover that is really stabilizing what would be a really sandy shoreline. Um, but at the same point, you can see different access points, steps down to the lake, a dock, uh, a little walking out to access the water, and then um, different boats that, again, it's the intent to utilize these lakes, but can we do it in a way that also gives some back to the lake? The bottom graphic here is maybe a little bit more common to what we see, where I'll say that middle, you know, maybe 30 to 50% of a parcel is really utilized for recreational purposes. You can see a pontoon, jet ski, dock, there's fire rings behind this. Um, but then what's what's critical for the lake is giving these edges back. It's giving the sides of your lot back to the lake where we have submergent, emergent, we have trees, shrubs, grasses. Um, so this is a natural shoreline condition. Um, when we say riprap, we tend to think of rock. Um, that's another way of saying it. There's different forms of this, but riprap is the loose placement of rock. Um, if we start stacking rock, it tends to be more of a wall. Um, this, this tends to have less habitat benefits, um, just simply because there isn't any livable space. It's, there's void in between rock, but largely um, we see the conversion of, of shoreline sometimes to rock for erosion control or shoreline stabilization, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, another shoreline type, we see beaches, um, self-explanatory. Uh, and then I guess to maybe a catch-all for other, this is kind of what Andrew was speaking to, um, the, the potentially mowed turf or uh, mowed turf that gets scorched and, and kind of becomes void of, of any, any, anything. Um, in some ways, I think these are great uh, starting points if you're interested in restoring your shoreline because you don't necessarily have to remove anything. You kind of have an open canvas to really work with in terms of designing, but keeping that in mind of, you know, where are you going to try to recreate and access the lake and where can you give back to the lake? Um, so that's kind of shoreline types. Um, as I mentioned, you know, shoreline stabilization is, is a number one leading cause, I think, for why people call me related to shoreline projects. Um, and I, I created this graphic because I think it really helps highlight different techniques that are available in, in, I guess, what is probably best for the lake and then where we move through all the way to the exception. So natural stabilization utilizes um, native plants to really stabilize the shoreline. We have what we call bioengineered. So you can see here, there's a single layer of rock um, that it's placed in a way that really helps break up ice sheets as they move in and hit this. Um, and then there's cases where we call it the exception, um, but rocking and, and greater riprap is needed. Some, some lakes face um, uh, what we call a long fetch. This is the max distance across the lake in which wind and wave energy can build up. So in the springtime, maybe some people face that this year, um, a big sheet of ice came plowing into their, their shorelines. Um, so this adds uh, more significant armory, but what we like to see in all three of these is an element of vegetation. So you can see even in the riprap case here, there's vegetation that's placed at the top. Sometimes people place it interspersed throughout, um, but it's really these techniques that help stabilize. And the reason that the native vegetation is so, so critical um, to getting established is here's a, I love this graphic. Um, here's a picture of Kentucky bluegrass, so a very common um, yard grass uh, people plant in Minnesota. Um, but on the side here is um, plant, plant height on going up and then plant root depth going down in feet. Um, so Kentucky bluegrass maybe has three to six inches tops of, of root mass. Um, but you can see all these different native, some are wildflowers, some are grasses of various heights, how complex their root system is. And that is what's really key at um, stabilizing shorelines uh, and, and why it's a critical component to get tailored into any restoration project. Um, so that said, I guess I always like to include this slide as well. Um, I, just over the years, I've, I've learned different things about different types of shorelines, and maybe this is kind of a summary slide. Um, rock and sand um, are very common 
commonly placed uh, on the landscape, I think in part because they're easy to place. Um, you can bring them in with a truck, you can dump them, they're relatively easy to lay out, um, and you can get this instant clean look, the suburban clean look. Um, I do like to note that these do degrade over time. They're not maintenance free, um, but they can last for a while. But uh, uh, the initial cost can be quite high in terms of the rock itself. And it's probably more costly once you need to do maintenance and repair um, because it involves picking rocks deeper out of the water, bringing them back up to the shore, um, pulling them away so you can relay tarp, things like that. Um, and then from a habitat perspective, again, there's very little to no habitat um, with, with these types of shorelines. Um, and then the, the, the natural shoreline conditions, so vegetation and wood components, um, I, I guess I won't deny that these are definitely usually a little bit more upfront additional effort in terms of, of planting and, and, and watering and weeding and all that upfront. I won't steal Lori's thunder, she'll get to that later. Um, but what I do like to point out, these are typically shorelines that strengthen over time. So as, as those native roots and of trees, shrubs, um, grasses get established, they, they tend to bolster themselves over time. So the, the return on investment can be higher um, in, in many cases. Um, so all that said, so shoreline type, different, different um, um, restoration and stabilization techniques. Why is there such an emphasis on shorelines? Um, the, the DNR just came out with a report um, to a larger council in Minnesota. And, and what that study was looking at is what's happening to the state's shorelines. And at a broad, broad lens, the state has lost about half of its um, natural shoreline over the last three decades. Um, we continue to lose at a pretty fast rate of one to 2% per year. And I think that's where what Angie was speaking to is we're starting to realize the, the impacts that that's having on the entire ecosystem itself and why it's important. Uh, so the state, what they did is they, they developed a shoreline evaluation method. Uh, lake managers tend to use what's called score the shore. Uh, individual property owners can uh, utilize uh, a tool called Score Your Shore. Um, very relatively simple um, qualitative assessments where it's really looking at, again, these three different zones on your property and answering questions of what portion or uh, what percentage of your parcel do you have things like trees, shrubs, um, natural buffers, ground cover, um, what kind of recreational activities are you pursuing and utilizing on your property? Again, the concept is to create awareness as to um, well, how are you using your property and how can you maybe uh, give a little bit or set aside a little bit for, for the lake. Uh, so anyway, the DNR did this uh, across a number of lakes across the entire state. Uh, I just zoomed in here to Washington and Chisago counties. And what they found through their assessment is there's no lakes within the two counties that they assess that score high. Um, three that score moderate, and then uh, 26 that score between low and very low. And kind of once we hit that point with low and very low, um, it's just a signal that there's quite a bit of shoreline development that's, it's kind of gone past the point where any significant form of, um, of, of shoreline habitat is really present and available for the lake. So in other words, it's causing a stress on that system. Um, so again, locally here, um, suggesting that there's definitely um, a concern and in, in room for in improvement in that regard. Uh, the this, this study, and, and I think my own general observations being out on many lakes um, is, uh, I guess I'm just gonna show you a few of these. So here's, here's two adjacent property owners that have pursued uh, very different ways to stabilize their shoreline. Um, I won't get into any more details on that. I think I've explained enough on that. Another trend that we see is people tend to like what their neighbors might have. Um, and, and the general trend with that is, is pursuing more of the hard armoring, the riprap, the rocking route, than kind of going the, the, the native, the natural vegetation route. Um, another trend um, is, is um, uh, I hear commonly is just 
people utilizing different contractors that may be not familiar with local rules or requirements. Um, so here's a before after of, of maybe what the landowner thought wasn't an aesthetically pleasing shoreline, but it was actually a very stable shoreline um, and, and they converted it to um, a project that actually um, caused it, it, it uh, doesn't conform to a lot of local requirements. So um, there are uh, times where people are getting themselves in, in a little bit of a bind, but just again, another trend that we see but really what the core of it, score your shore and score the shore is really looking for is these six categories. Um, the top three are, are vegetation related. So um, do you have aquatic submerged vegetation? Do you have emergent vegetation growing? Um, on the shoreline, do you have native ground cover? Do you have some form of, of buffer? It can be grasses, it can be wildflowers. Um, and then from the upland portion and even along the shoreline, do you have trees and shrubs that are creating screening? Um, you know, if you're out on the lake, the goal is to kind of not always see every aspect of your property and your home. Um, and what that does, though, for a habitat benefit is it provides places for different organisms to, to, to live in. Uh, the bottom three are related to coarse woody debris. So this is more than just a twig in the lake. These are like substantial logs or downed trees that create a bunch of nooks and crannies for organisms to live in. But we have the overhanging. Um, we have the loafing logs, so this typically is what turtles or ducks would be hanging out on, and then we have the down coarse woody debris. This is logs and things that are submerged that um, you'll often see fishermen in the spring, especially targeting because there's fish all over these woody debris piles because of the structure for them. So these are the core habitat elements that, that, uh, that we're looking to incorporate back, and this is ultimately how we get those scores of individual shorelines and in, in, as a lake as a whole to begin to, to increase. So what does this look like uh, for somebody? So here's a property owner. You can see kind of if I, in the back a little bit, there's a pontoon and a dock. That's not more than 40 feet away um, with uh, a space in there for accessing for swimming and that. But this portion of the shoreline incorporates a lot of those really critical uh, core elements of habitat that I talked about from the down woody debris to wood in the water, or hanging wood, and then the shoreline itself, you can see it's pretty robust with different shrubs and probably some trees in there, and then uh, emergent and, and shoreline vegetation. Here's just another image of a different property. So this property owner was a little bit more in what I call an embayment or protected area. So they got different species that tended to grow. But what we see from left to right here is species that prefer to almost be in water 24 seven, um, 365 days of the year, all the way up slope where we kind of get into more sedges and grasses uh, species. And then uh, this last image here is kind of on the top side of a shoreline restoration where people tend to incorporate the flowering species more for an aesthetic appeal. Um, so the, the, the lower in the landscape, those are the ones that are kind of doing the, the hard work of protecting and stabilizing where these upper embankment can provide more of that aesthetic appeal if that's that's a desire. So um, again, so this is really the core of, of different shoreline types and, and some background of maybe what we're looking at. Um, so now I'm gonna pivot gears um, and, and go back kind of to, to the science of shorelines a little bit. Um, this is a little more in my wheelhouse. So uh, I, I did a little, little research review uh, leading into this and, and looking at different studies of what's out there and what's leading um, us to understand and, and really promote these natural shoreline conditions. So there's a study done that um, you can see a couple different images here, but what they did is they went to a remote lake in uh, just across the border in Wisconsin. And what they did is they put a curtain across the lake, they split it in two. And what they did is they went into half the lake and they removed um, uh, really large, woody structure from the entire shoreline. They left some, um, but they removed the majority of it. And then they measured the response of what they saw within the lake and what happened between the two sides. Um, so here's some graphics, I'll just explain it, but they use largemouth bass, so a very common recreated for species. Uh, and what they saw was a significant change in the available food for the largemouth bass. Um, they tracked it through time and what that led to was decreased um, um, or it led to a diet shift. The preferred food was no longer available. 
that then that ultimately led to a change in what we call the fitness and health. So people were catching smaller, thinner, um, stunted bass versus big lunkers that people like to fish for. Um, so that was one study. So in other words, in summary, wood is really good for the lake. I think this image really sums up that really well, where you can see this is a, a tree that had fallen. It's stabilized the, the lake bed, so you can even see aquatic plants growing up. But I mean, there's a number of fish that just utilize the, the, all those little nooks and crannies to, to live in. Um, more species utilize this. So here we have turtles, amphibians, the kingfisher that utilize these down in woody habitats as well. Um, Here's, here's another research paper. So this one I'll explain a little bit more. Um, these are called species occurrence curves. And what I tell people, the concept behind them is if you go out to a, a lake and you find a specific type of shoreline, how many spots could you sample on the shoreline before you run out of finding new species? Um, so that's kind of what this bottom axis is, is number of sample sites and then total number of species here. So what we see is they sampled four different types of, of shorelines and the higher and longer the curve means it took them a lot longer to find or run out of finding new species and natural shorelines had the most species diversity followed by riprap seawalls and then beaches so again these non-natural shoreline conditions we started to see um, less species diversity in both um, bugs and fish um, what I like to point out about this is here's a, a, a family of ducks that we don't, we don't see what's below the surface, but in a very natural setting, um, they don't have to go very far to get the nutrients and energy that they need to grow throughout the year. Um, science of uh, shoreline food webs. So here's just two different graphical representations of what a food web might look like on the right. Um, with different organisms, you know, with your walleye and your northern pike at the top of an aquatic food chain, feed on bluegill, perch, uh, all the way down to your plant material. So that this translates to these um, intricate uh, food web diagrams here on the right, where the lower is the plants and the, the upper is the different fish and, and predators. But what we can see here is in the undeveloped shorelines, you can see the number um, but also the complexity of how all the lines are kind of going everywhere. But when we move to different shoreline types, that complexity is significantly diminished. Uh, so here's here's just an image. So there's, uh, I counted, there's about six different species in here. Um, most of these uh, species aren't necessarily great. There's carp, there's bullhead, fathead minnow, and, and stunted sunfish. So this was taken from a, uh, a poor lake on a, a non-healthy shoreline. Uh, here's another one that I find fascinating, signs of shoreline plants. Um, I like to point out that all um, dragonflies start off as an aquatic insect. Um, they, they, they live in the water, but they require something to climb out on to molt and ultimately turn into the dragonflies that we see see around. So we've probably all seen this on a different read at a different time. So the molt of, of a dragonfly. But in summary, what the research shows is both the aquatic plants and then the emergent plants are critical for all life stages of, of dragonflies. Um, and, and again, the molting process, I mean, here's the dragonfly wings, they're paper thin, so they need that sunshine to really warm up. And without it, we lose that, um, that organism that really helps control gnats, mosquitoes, noceums, all the way down to kind of all those pest uh, things we don't enjoy in the summer. Um, and then previously we showed just different plants along the shoreline. Here's monarch butterfly just feasting on some metal blazing star, um, another uh, plant that does well along shoreline. So um, to take away maybe from the science of, of going through that review is again, shoreline modifications uh, on a significant scale um, definitely have uh, a negative influence on the lake ecosystem and ultimately why there's uh, kind of this effort to promote and, and move towards more of these natural shoreline conditions that blend better the recreational component. Um, so pivoting a little bit, um, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, moving kind of to some of the regulations around shorelines, I'd like to bring this up 
front in terms of, again, those different lakes, shore zones, and authorities. Um, and I have both Washington County here, and then the next slide will be Chisago County. Um, and really the difference is if, if you're within a watershed district, um, your watershed district is likely going to have some rules and requirements for you to consider. Um, but you can see here that in the shoreline area of the lake, watershed, county, city, township, and DNR likely all have some form of ordinance or regulations governing shoreline alterations or development within kind of that thousand feet of, of the lake. Um, again, here's Chisago County. So if you don't have a watershed district, um, you still likely want to check with your county, um, your, your SWCD, your city township, your DNR in terms of maybe what some of those local um, requirements are. Yeah, so uh, I guess starting off too, what can you do as, as a local um, property owner? Um, my best advice is contact your local governing units, your watershed districts, your man watershed management organization, city township, um, and possibly even the DNR. Um, if you're considering kind of doing any of these following items, rip wrapping, retaining walls, putting in sand, um, sand beach, sand blanket. If you wanna um, redevelop part of your lake shore property in terms of patios, decks, sheds, these kind of sometimes slip through the cracks for people in terms of just making sure that they meet and conform with local requirements. And then um, ice eaves is a common one people ask me about um, that I'll get to in a little bit here. But I'm going to kind of touch on each of these a little bit more um, in detail. Uh, that maybe they'll, they'll pull some tidbits away. Um, yeah, so shoreline and um, I guess stream bank riprap. Um, this would be you know, installation of rock. Um, the intent behind it is to place it in an area that there's a demonstrated need of erosion or there's a high likelihood that erosion will occur. Um, the intent behind riprap though is not to remove shoreline vegetation, emergent or submergent vegetation to put in, in rock. Um, and then there's also local government units that might have more stringent requirements uh, for this. So sometimes starting at the state is a good spot, but finishing more with your local governing bodies is a great way to go. I think some common mis misconceptions about um, installation of riprap is that rocking the shoreline is a great landscape practice to make an area more beautiful. I think um, there people have different aesthetic appeals, but um, I don't think that it's a, a, a great landscaping practice in terms of benefit to the to the lake. Um, there has to be a real demonstrated need again uh, for it, and then there's very strict requirements in terms of how it needs to be installed. Um, so here, here's a here's another one that I had mentioned earlier um, that I used a contractor for the work. Um, so the top image is actually a very stable shoreline and a very desired shoreline for a lake ecosystem. Well, as you can see, the bottom image that was completely converted to a, a rock shoreline. Um, so just be careful um, sometimes uh, on that front. Another misconception. Uh, we hear frequently as we follow DNR guidance, um, and it, maybe it's the fine print, but uh, just denoted here that there are local, that even the DNR says check in with your local governing units just to make sure. Um, for example, Chicago County Shoreland Ordinance, um, riprap, they have a special rule, you know, riprap can't be above the ordinary high water mark um, or greater than three feet in exceedance. Um, and then for our watershed district, um, there has to be clear demonstration that um, softer approaches like bioengineering or natural shoreline won't work before we can move on to something like, like riprap. So again, um, DNR does promote the checking in with local governing bodies. Creating a beach is another one that um, I'll, I'll get questions about. Um, so creating a beach, um, you might hear the term beach and sand blanket. Beach would actually be like excavating an area and then filling it with sand. The sand blanket, that's not really allowed in very special cases. Um, otherwise, the common one is sand blanket. This would be, you have to kind of put sand on the existing slope and grade. Um, 
And what I tell people is it's not really intended to be everywhere. I know sometimes people see their neighbors or people across the lake have them, um, but not every place on a lake is conducive for it. Um, yeah, let's see. So sand blankets, kind of general rules from the DNR. Um, uh, yeah, you can't necessarily cover um, aquatic vegetation. You got to maintain it on both sides of your sand blankets. You can't have a lot line to lot lined layer of sand. There's certain dimensions that it has to conform to. Uh, another one that um, uh, sometimes gets overlooked is that sand um, is only allowed twice in the same location. Um, and this is why uh, I think it's it's not necessarily good everywhere because some areas are really uh, conducive for wave energy that would wash it into the lake. So if you're if you're a property owner and you constantly are bringing in sand, um, it's likely telling you know nature's telling us that it's not a really good spot for it because all you're doing is you're putting it into the lake and what it's doing is it's kind of covering and smothering everything that's out there. Um, yeah, and it's not intended to be placed over emergent vegetation. So few few rules from the DNR. Again, uh, they do highlight, you know, call your local governing bodies to make sure that uh, you're conforming to local requirements. Um, so ours kind of go above and beyond the DNR where we have specific criteria and call outs in terms of how thick that sand layer can be. And then, you know, 50 feet wide or one half the width of the lot, whichever is less. Um, and then our rules only allow repeating sand placement once in the same location. So just kind of an example of how, how some rules, local rules can go above and beyond. Clearing trees to see the water better is another frequent uh, ask that I get of people. So the image on the left here, I would say it does a great job of kind of creating a recreational corridor to get down to the lake. Um, but then maintains that that habitat, that screening component. Um, the, the property on the right maybe is a better example of one that uh, there really isn't a lot of screening and vegetation that was is left behind. Um, so it kind of loses that intent. Um, but in terms of clearing trees, um, uh, oh yeah, I guess, sorry, I've probably been forgetting to mention stuff about the riverway. So if you're on the St. Croix, um, tree removal um, pulls in the National Park Service, most likely, um, depending on where you are in, in any easement. Um, and historically, they've done a great job of ensuring that screening and, and that, that elements there. From a, a shore uh, lake perspective, an inland lake, um, a lot of this is governed by your local, um, your local entity of the city or potentially your county um, has requirements in terms of tree removal. So, Typically dead or dangerous trees to your property can be removed just with a simple notification. Um, any more extensive, um, it can be done, uh, but it usually just comes with a re uh, an ask or requirement of trying to replace trees back on your property. So sometimes there's nuisance trees or dangerous trees that are still living that people want to get rid of. And I just have to submit a basic hand sketch plan of where these trees are and, and how you might go about replacing them. So maybe where to check trees. Um, ice heaves, again, this is a very frequent one, especially early in the spring. Um, what I can say is uh, typically ice heaves can be removed without much more than just uh, an approval. Um, but however, just contact your, your local city, county, um, or water zoning uh, administration, because um, that's all you likely need. Um, but what I tell people is when you're thinking about it, um, I always ask the question of like, why did an ice heave occur? And, and is there something you can do to kind of prevent it? But three questions to kind of think for yourself is when you're removing an ice heave is how are you going to remove it? Are you getting in there with a shovel or is it something as big as this image to the top left where you might have to bring in an excavator? There might be some local requirements with heavy equipment along the shoreline. Um, where are you going to take the materials? Sometimes there's very strict requirements that um, if it's sand or gravel, you might be able to just kind of level it back out. If it's organic and weed filled, you might actually have to haul it off site. Um, and then probably the one that I think catches most people is how are you going to stabilize it after? So if I were to take out this ice heave on the top left here, that's going to expose a bunch of bare sediment, which is nutrient rich, that if I don't stabilize it somehow, it's going to flush into the lake. Um, 
And, and I think this is where removing an ice heave and stabilizing it gets people in trouble because removing an ice heave and then replacing it with, with rock or sand or something like that isn't necessarily a true stabilization technique, or it might be, but it's one that then requires a permanent. So, um, yeah, so just be conscious of that. And then um, I do point out, you know, so here's three images of somebody removed um, a big, uh, they had mowed up to the shoreline, they got a big ice heap, so they removed it, replaced it with uh, rip riprap, and then the following winter, all of their riprap ice heaved. So um, just be careful and conscious about that. And, and maybe where if, if you're thinking you have this problem and you want to fix it, um, I always tell people try to think about it in stages of, again, where are you going to utilize your shoreline and where are you going to recreate with it and maybe fix just that portion and then maybe try to give some of your shoreline back to the lake because it seems like Mother Nature is trying to take it from you anyway. So if you can maybe cover it with different plantings or trees or different things, you kind of hide the blemish maybe of the undesired you create the little space that you want to utilize um, and it's uh, it saves you from kind of redoing an, an entire shoreline just to have the same problem arise a year three years four years later um yeah this is another good one that uh, people um kind of find out more after the fact but creating um fire ring patios or patios decks out by the shoreline um this usually falls on your local governing unit, so your city or township. So check with your zoning and development code um, group, but typically these are prohibited. I know a lot of these historically were grandfathered in, but um, in replacing them, there's pretty strict in-kind replacement requirements typically, because um, the, the what we don't want to see is the expansion of, of these types of surfaces. So. So just check in on that and maybe a clarification. If you want to put a, like a metal ring out in your grass, that's not what we're considering a fire ring pit patio. It's more of this image here where you're creating a lot of hard surface. Um, just check in on that. Stairs, lifts, docks. This is another great one. Um, this really, uh, I guess I'll start maybe with docks. That kind of falls more on the DNR. They do have requirements uh, about dock sizing and shape. Um, but typically your, your single dock span going out, maybe L shaped or U shaped uh, are pretty common, no issues typically there. If you get a, a deck where you wanna create kind of like a big patio out on the end, just check with your, your, your DNR official because sometimes that's where people run in any trouble. Um, that or you turn your dock sideways and run it across your shoreline, they consider it a boardwalk. It's not very common. Sometimes people and neighbors will do it if they're in a really tight area. Um, that's that's not allowed. Um, but again, just check with, with DNR. And, uh, uh, lifts and stairs, again, check with your zoning administrator. Um, these are definitely permittable. No one wants to prevent people from getting down to a lake, especially if you have um, a, a steep incline or just, I, I guess, handicap reasons or anything. Uh, there's just typically uh, safety development codes to make sure that it's being installed appropriately. Um, yeah, so that's what I can maybe say on that front. Um, adding additions to the homes. Um, I think more common people think about if they're expanding kind of outward, if they're adding onto their house to create another room and stuff. Um, there's development codes, there's zoning, septic codes. You start with your county or your local governing unit there. Um, sometimes going up vertically also has limitations. Um, again, this would be your zoning administrator in terms of, uh, you know, there, there can be height restrictions. If you're along the St. Croix uh, River itself, um, there's, there's limits with color, um, windows, all of that. So that gets a little bit more intense uh, in terms of those requirements. For the watershed's perspective, when people start to add on or redevelop the parcel, what we really try to do is, is find ways to allow the project to move forward, but can we capture the stormwater running off what we call impervious surfaces? So these are hard surfaces that water doesn't penetrate through. Um, and rather than flushing it off to the lake or your neighbor's property, we try to work with you to implement something like rain gardens or rain barrels that help uh, infiltrate that water into the ground. Um, 
And then my last slide, and then I'm going to kick it over to Lori. So thanks for, for hanging with me is my three bullet points about what you can do as a, as a lakeshore owner. Um, again, big thing, uh, just see where you can get creative. Where are you willing and able to give back to the lake? Um, then next great step is contact your your uh, SWCD, so your conservation district, your, your watershed district, your local governing unit to maybe schedule a site visit to walk through some of these. Um, your your local officials are, we're going to have our staff, are going to have a good a sense of what rules and requirements are. But on top of that, we're going to have a good sense of maybe where we can provide technical assistance, what are free design services, where are grant opportunities, cost share opportunities that are going to help you help pay to put in some of these projects. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, if you're not familiar with the, the Carfax um, Fox commercials, I, I like to say if you're going to hire this out, um, just ask your local contractor to actually show you a written communication um, saying that a permit is not required. It's it's um, and if they don't, I, I warn just be careful because um, the if if a, if a violation does occur, it comes back to the property owner, not the contractor, as a starting point. So um, it, it it's never fun for anybody if that's the case. But that's where um, after the fact situations do start to usually end. So. Yeah, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll pause, I'll jump off here, and I'll turn it over to Lori. Hi, gang. <laughs> I'm going to try and share my screen here. Let's see if it works. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a lot of information that you just imparted upon us. So. I'm glad to know that we're going to have a recording to be able to check back on that. I loved a lot of the diagrams that you shared. Are we set? Are you able to see the slideshow? Indeed, I can see it just fine, Laurie. Excellent. Well, so thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Laurie Tella, and I work for the Washington Conservation District. So kind of some of the um, things that Tom was talking about were actually the ones that can come out and do a free site visit and help answer these questions because it's quite complex. Um, it's a free service. So anyway, feel free to reach out about that. Um, we had a different one of these workshops um, earlier. So there is some overlap if you've attended before. Um, so just bear with me. I'm gonna try and skip over a little bit of this um, as well because we're just I just wanna make sure we have some time for questions. Um, Yes, yeah, so my background, I'm a landscape architect and I've been working on um, in conservation for um, as far as I can remember, um, just really getting involved in a lot of different states and um, different ecosystems, but this is a really beautiful one to be in. So I have a lot of things I wanted to talk about, but um, probably focusing on bioengineering tonight and landscape design. So first, um, as I do site visits, this is basically what my day looks like. I'll show up on a site visit and the landowner has a concern um, eroding shore and we just try to figure out what's going on. So in this case, they know they took out some vegetation and then the shore started just carving away at the soil. So once you identify that, that's the first step. Uh, these landowners had, they can see the tracks, so they know what happened. They had some construction, um, kind of impacts on their property in a big muddy mess. Um, I've been noticing this a little bit more often. There's shorelines that are such, um, they're obvious where the vegetation remained, where the native vegetation is. And then you can see how the lawn is just marching towards the homeowner's um, property. It's just getting carved away. So it really speaks to that um, native vegetation has a big capacity of of stabilizing. Um, lots of other problems, geese. Your shoreline may look like this with invasive species. If you see anything that goes on forever, it's probably invasive. Um, eroding lawn, this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, and then the solutions. Typically, let's put some rock on it. Let's put a retaining wall. Um, we'll do the rip wrap all the way up to the shore, and then we'll spray it with herbicide, and we'll let the fertilizer run right into the creek without any vegetation. 
And this is, you know, this is pretty typical. And in some cases it's necessary, but in other cases it's something to be, maybe we can find an alternative. Um, and then the equipment of can have big impacts too. So bioengineering is basically applying the principles of biology and the tools of engineering. So we're trying to get a better blend of um, technology and nature here. Um, so you can preserve existing vegetation. You can regrade live staking, coir rolls, soil lifts, tow boulder stabilization, native plants, and then this picture of a riprap with buffer. So that's kind of um, the, the first bar is just something like that. Um, the benefits of bioengineering is we really get these more resilient uh, shorelines. They call them living shorelines. They're more adaptable. You get the fish and wildlife, um, improves the water quality, and protects your property. If you are lucky enough to have a beautiful shoreline, the best thing you can do is preserve it. Um, so this is kind of just all of the things that are going on. It's functioning like a machine. Um, you've got underneath, you've got all kinds of um, habitat and then connectivity to the uplands between the different animal species versus more of a conventional solution where things are actually starting to get blocked off. So here's a retaining wall. And you can see how the scour is starting to, um, with the wave action, it can start scouring. And then from the uplands, you can see that there's um, a potential to have water running behind the walls. And then of course that poor turtle is just not gonna have a chance um, to get up um, over that wall. So the first um, one is the slope regrading. So if you came, if you were so lucky to have a site like this, um, please call me out, we'll talk about it. Um, so with, with bioengineering, you typically are either pushing out to re, you're trying to stabilize that slope and get like a two to one or a three to one gradual slope. So you can either push out waterward and try to reclaim that slope, or you can push back to your home, which is the preferred method. And in this case, there are structures that are going to be right in the way of doing that. Um, so that's kind of the problem with um, this guy's in a tough position. So you can either just plant the sides or you can try and reclaim then you're in permit zone when you have to go into the water. Um, so I'll show you some ideas for him. So live staking, um, this is something where you can get willows, dogwoods, um, snowberry, and you just get cuttings and you pound them in. And it is pretty much um, a miracle how they re-sprout. Um, this works really well on those eroding, steep, rocky slopes. And um, you can also put them in kind of horizontally across the slope. Um, you dig in a trench and you lay them in, just try to use all biodegradable materials. And then over time, this is willow stakes and they just, they just take off within a year. So that's one way for cheap. Um, this is a diagram of it. So there's some, you can um, cut at an angle, make sure the buds are up. There's a lot of different um, techniques, but at the bottom, you'll see that there's something called a coir log. And that one is what we're gonna talk about next. But a lot of these practices you use together, try and have a bunch of them all at once. Um, here's the biolog. It's a picture of what one might look, look like at the base. Um, these are also called fiber rolls. Um, they're really good for the low to moderate energy sites. So this is gonna be something, it's not suitable for high wave activity. This would be, maybe in um, combination with some other techniques, but we're gonna try and keep this one really for um, kind of the mild um, stabilization. So a simple shoreline. Um, this is what it looks like installed. You can just meander it across your landscape. They come in like 10 foot sections and you just, the big trick is to have really deep stakes and then tie them together with a fiber rope. And you can use that with the, with rocks and tow boulders if you would like. Um, but the idea is just um, get, get that installed and you can tier it, which is a cool approach. You can have double um, biologs. Um, you can have it right where it's undercut on the tow and just kind of use it to plant in and make up some of that grade and get it a little more of a gentle slope. You can pop it out further in the shore and then 
put some aquatic vegetation behind it and let it be kind of like a break. So you protect that, um, those, that vegetation from just mild waves. Um, let's see, so you can put a plant directly into these. So that's really fun. Um, and then over, over time, they just biodegrade. So they shouldn't be lasting there forever. They're just intended to get the plants established. And then you can see the, the plants just kind of take over. The other piece, uh, Tom touched on these. So toe stabilization um, this is something that's suitable. It's kind of a riprap combination, but it's suited for the high energy sites where you just need some armoring. armoring. Um, rock can be layered at the toe of the shoreline, combined with all of these other techniques. Um, the idea here is that you are able to just start absorbing some of that um, energy. And you can see there's a little uh, frog on the bottom and he's making his way up to the shore and it's not gonna be as hard as if it were those uh, retaining walls. And also there's um, live, or the live staking. So you're starting to see how all these pieces are just overlapping. Um, this is one locally, a, a toe stabilization example, um, a detail of them. So you're basically putting, um, there's an opportunity to get um, some soil to make up that grade through here. You're able to fill this with soil and that was the original grade with a steep drop off. We're in DNR land now where we need to get uh, potentially a permit. Actually, there's ordinary high. So this project is shown as above ordinary high, but this would basically be an approach you could use. And this is in plan view, just showing how those boulders are staggered and then you plant densely. Um, soil lifts, these are really cool. So an encapsulated soil lift, um, they're used when you can't slope back because there is gonna be a house there like that first picture. Um, maybe there's a roadway or other infrastructure. So you're really pushing out into the lake in this case, and that's making up a pretty steep grade. Um, you can use um, actually a really thick erosion control blanket. Um, and you just, again, you're starting to see like multiple um, bioengineering techniques layered on this one. You've got the um, toe boulders, you're starting to get the live staking and um, the core logs are inside as the fabric is wrapped around the soil and you're starting to get almost like tiered steps. Um, so examples of people just planting right into it, just go ahead and cut through and plant it up. Um, it can be on a stream side too. These aren't just for shorelines. Um, yes, so just plant on in and you can see this is kind of that tiered double core log plus with a soil lift. There's um, sometimes you'll need to put in a temporary wave break um, just to kind of protect your work or a silt fence to make sure you're not causing any um, soil to go out into the water. Those are some examples. And then native planting, I just want to put this out there because um, the native plants are probably the biggest machine that we have. So your shoreline, if you don't have a big erosion problem going, you can plant directly into the soil. You can put down some erosion control fabric and call it a day. Um, it doesn't have to be anything other than the plants. The plants are, are gonna do quite a bit. This is that graphic Tom showed that you can just see those roots and they're better than any amount of um, staking or concrete. Um, so as we're starting to choose plant material, just keeping in mind Different plants have different heights. Um, you're looking at different colors. You're gonna be looking at the soil, the amount of light and dark. Um, so the plants are all part of that. Um, they also have zones. So there's, um, if you're using this core log, there's a medium, um, kind of the upland vegetation extends over this way. Um, you have shoreline and emergence, and then it really gets into more of an aquatic zone. So realizing that there's upland where you might put your more showy plants. Um, there's examples like the yellow coneflower, asters, purple coneflower. These are all the ones that are going to be up by your house that you can maintain easily. Thinking about height, um, maybe putting some of the smaller ones up front. 
uh, shady if you've got shady sites these are some of the best ones the wild geranium um, is a lovely like long bloomer um, yeah and the ginger spreads really well so if you'd like something that's a good spreader the tr transitional is going to be something like you'd find along a stream bank um, it can handle both getting wet and um, drying out so this is something like the Joe pie weed, swamp milkweed, sneezeweed. Um, asters are fun because they bloom later in the season. Maybe grab an aster. And then the bulrushes. Um, aquatic, this is more what's exactly what's in the water. It might be what's in that core log too. Um, you can do brushes, um, free square, square bulrush, arrowhead, the blue flag iris does really well, and um, aquatic conditions. And um, Let's see, also white water lily. So I couldn't help myself digging into the plants, but they are a machine. They're one of the best bioengineering techniques that we've got. Um, so we can touch on shoreline design. Um, looks like we have some time left. Um, so we'll be looking at the first step for shoreline design is evaluating your site. So when I'm coming out, um, I'm a bit of a conservation detective. I'm gonna work with you guys to try and figure out what the problem is with your shore. Um, we try and figure out where the erosion is coming from. Is it coming from the lake? Is it coming from upland? Um, sometimes your own house can be contributing to the erosion. Sometimes somebody built a new city and that is flooding out and changing the dynamics of your water. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why things might be happening. Um, it could be a recreational lake. Is it coming from just boats? Um, is it naturally changing into a wetland um, or getting deeper uh, for other reasons? And so there is natural change to shorelines and something's going to change over time no matter what we do. We just need to find a more resilient solution. So when evaluating your site, come up with the invasive plants, identify them, we'll come up with a plan, but that's one of the very first steps is just what the problems are, what your challenges are, gather as much data as you can, where's that ordinary high water line. You can get that surveyed or you can find it on um, Lake Finder, uh, but you're basically going to want to figure out where your ordinary high is, the soil type, if you're in sun and shade, um, where all your locations of your docks and structures are, um, and then you make a plan. So I usually check regulations first before my creativity goes crazy because all my ideas are usually kicked to the curb once I read the regulations. Um, so starting with DNR, they have amazing guides on their website, uh, they try. And one of the first things to know is there is an aquatic plant management permit for anything below the ordinary high. So if you're planting, it's a super easy permit, it doesn't cost anything, but you just basically run your plant list by the fisheries specialist to make sure you aren't planting something invasive. Um, if you're removing invasive, they want you to also let them know so they make sure that you're not like making a mess and spreading root fibers everywhere in the way that you're removing those. Um, if you're breeding, using herbicide, all of that, DNR. Um, you can talk to the watershed districts and with the conservation district, we do have our own general permit. Um, so we can actually help with some of these projects now and save some money. Um, so yeah, you're just gonna take an aerial and start drawing, map out your existing features. Um, this is a plan where it's a site analysis. They wrote everything down. If you take a look, they took, um, they wrote where their buckthorn was. They wrote where they were having honeysuckle and a culvert um, crossing. They went into the detail of their, of course, their property lines, important um, access areas, the good, the bad, the ugly. So just throw it on a plan. It doesn't have to be hand-drawn and rendered. You can mark up with a highlighter and a marker on an aerial, and it's just fine. Um, as you start to make the next step of your plan, I usually meet with the landowners and I sit down and have a nice conversation about how you really use the space, how you imagine using the space in the future. So you can think about your family. Um, you know, do you have kids? Do you have pets? Do you like to entertain? In the future, are your goals to reduce maintenance? Are you hoping to sell the property? 
do you want to make this a mecca for butterflies? Like just trying to think through your goals. Um, a lot of people just want um, a couple, a little couple areas for privacy. And so that's nice to note. Um, it's an opportunity to plant some plants. Um, I usually like to think about designing for a critter. So thinking about wildlife, if I like butterflies or turtles or something like that, trying to get your head around what kind of habitat you would like to develop. And then finally your design style. Um, so yeah, thinking about how it functions, just throwing on some ideas of like, oh, this is where I want to have my boat dock. This is where I want to swim. So you'll have shoreline access, um, shoreline buffers. So this is starting to show how you can create buffers without having lawn straight up to the shore. Um, this is an example of that upland problem. I was telling you the houses were actually causing this um, existing kind of real erosion that was coming down. So we're actually proposing doing some sort of rain garden to capture that water. So it's not always just the shore. They're having a you know, core log and some stabilization, but it's actually a problem from their house. So as you're designing, think about the fun spots like paths and places to sit. Um, this is a design that, you know, you should really be out and enjoying how to get yourself out and appreciating this space. Boat access. So this design style is a little more organized and formal. Um, the plants are very clustered, so this is a design look you could go for. Uh, more of a native approach, um, right? Not a whole lot of transition, just right up to lawn. You could be super contemporary and just pick a couple plants and just mass them. Um, this has some onion in it. Let's see. This is over at Minnehaha Creek Watershed District on Lake Minnetonka, so it's you know, as long as you're upstream, you can still put in some ornamentals. So if you'd like to have kind of that formal edge, um, you can go for it. And this is also an excelsior. So it's down by the, um, that's Lake Minnetonka. You can go dip your toes in uh, there. They have more of a wild look. So they just did restoration. And then they put in that split rail fence just to kind of let people know like, hey, we meant to do this. And they have a nice sign and a path as well. Um, you can do a formal edge. Uh, this is prairie drop seed. That really makes a difference in letting people know, hey, I meant to do this. <laughs> it's intentional. You can go with a paver um, edging. That's nice too. Massing your natives is a nice approach. It also helps with like identifying for the next year, like if there's weeds, because you know there's only two plants in that bed that can help with, with that. Um, and then drifts, like thinking about putting drifts all throughout the landscape. So you can just carry one or two plants throughout the entire um, length of your shore. Letting, um, remember to let uh, natural elements happen. So if a tree leans over or a branch falls in, um, that's all part of the process. And creating habitat that we're hoping to do. So yeah, of course, our monarch, um, you can plant milkweed. So if you pick uh, an animal you want to design for, that puts some bars on, some guidance to what you want to pick. So say you want to do birds, you want to do turtles, there's an entire set of plants I can give you for, say, wanting to do bird habitat versus pollinator or turtles. This is an example of the type of plan we might do. The, the main idea is just figure out how much area you have. Um, so in this case, you know, how many square feet are going to be in each area. And then this is showing you don't really need to do a detailed planting plan for the entire shore where every single plant is. Come up with like a, an idea of five or ten plants you want and then just repeat it. Um, and then get the numbers. Um, same with this one. This is like a plan we did for a landowner who's having like the coral logs and then the stable rock toe. But just, you know, keeping the plant planting plan simple. Um, you can go all out and definitely, I encourage this if you're one of the more formal or organized and you, you're a gardener and this can just be done by hand. Um, you can just make bubbles with 
they just have what they do is they put the plant name and then they say that's A and they count how many there are. I think project installation was covered by Alyssa really well in the last webinar. So I don't know how we're doing for time here, Angie. Do you want me to pause? Yeah, perhaps we could pause because we're at 748. Um, so maybe we can pause and see if folks have any questions for Lori and Tom on some of the topics they talked about or any specific concerns you have for your own lake or your own property that you'd like to ask while we have the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Dan. Hi. Okay. Uh, my situation is kind of unique. I, I, I love preserving the shoreline. What I've got is an area where the whole backyard behind the house, away from the lake, is all drained down the driveway into the lake without any filtration or any slowing down. And I, I think I'd like Lori to come out and give me some ideas. I've got a wonderful ice berm on the rest of it. So I've preserved all that because uh, I figure that's a great filter. Uh, I'm just letting come up whatever comes up there. But what I'm, what I'm really here for and wondering about is that area that drains down, down the driveway, un, unimpeded. That's what I'm talking about. Things are, are coming from upland quite a bit. And it's, um, you know, it's our roads, our streets, our houses. So it is a bit of like sleuthing to figure out what's going on and then how can we, you know, how can we stop it? There could be ways that we could tear it and capture it as it moves down the space. Yeah. Um, Lori, there was a question uh, if the plans that you showed are something that's done free of charge. And maybe it would be useful for me to real quick um, talk about some of the services that are available through the conservation districts and the watershed districts. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to bop you off, but then you can be bopped back on again. <laughs> um, I was going to talk briefly about the watershed district cost share grants for those of you who live in a watershed district and SWCD site visits. So I have listed here watershed districts that are in Washington County and all of these watershed districts have some version of a grant program that helps to support native planting projects, shoreline restoration projects, and even things like rain gardens. So when Dan was talking a moment ago about having a lot of runoff creating problems for a driveway. I know that that's a situation where a lot of times somebody would work with the landowner to design a rain garden. Um, so each of the grant programs are gonna be slightly different for each watershed district, um, but just know that they do all have grant support available. Um, I did wanna highlight one that is kind of unique because it's in its pilot phase and it just started this year. Um, the Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District for the past, um, I'm gonna say seven or eight years has only had a plant grant program. Um, and Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed, that's for any of you who are on Forest Lake, Kewatin Lake, Bone Lake, Comfort Lake. Um, they're piloting two new programs this year. One is a competitive grant project um, that would fund up to 75% of projects up to $7,500. So this is a lot bigger grant than what they have previously been offering. And shoreline restorations is one of the kinds of projects that they're specifically looking to fund. Um, and another, this one is kind of interesting, legacy payment program. Um, so this is for folks, once you get your project in place, you've restored your shoreline and it's looking really great, um, then you can actually get payments of $300 per year to help be able to maintain that shoreline once you get it um, kind of up to snuff, so to speak. And then um, if you live in Washington County, you can sign up for a free site visit and somebody like Lori, it might be Lori, or if you're in a different, you know, depending on what part of the county you're in, it might be somebody else, um, but they can come out for free and walk your property with you, talk about your concerns, um, and then tell you what grants 
are available to you. And if you are qualifying for a watershed district grant, then yes, then Lori would be able to help you put together um, the design plan. And then you could either work with the conservation district and on your own to get it done or hire a contractor that would be able to help you get that done. Um, if you're not getting a cost share grant, then I think we have kind of like a slightly less intense, um, you know, just less detailed landscape design plan that our staff can help you put together. Um, but if you're in one of the other water or one of the other counties, usually the Soil and Water Conservation District, at least for shoreline landowners, is going to be able to do site visits, even if they don't do it for all of the landowners in their county. Um, so I will be sure to send out, um, like I said, just a list of resources tomorrow for depending on where you are in the state and who you can contact to help you out. Um, I already dropped this in the chat, just a bunch of resources through the Minnesota DNR. Um, and then the one last question that people are always asking is where to buy native plants. Um, so I always like to share this really nice brochure from Minnesota Wild Ones. And it's got you know a map of Minnesota and Western Wisconsin and shows the location of all sorts of different native plant nurseries. And they do also have a list of landscape design companies that specialize in working with native plants. So there's some great recommendations there as well. Okay, so that um, I think gets us back to then questions. <laughs> and feel free to elaborate, Lori, if, um, if you wanna say anything more about like the designs you're typically putting together for people. Yeah, so those are free. We um, come out, we do a site visit, uh, we help you with the concept, we help you with the estimate, and then if you do want to go for the grant, uh, it's on you to kind of, I'll, I'll give you a cost estimate, but we usually like that you actually get it um, quoted, and then you can apply for the grants, unless you're D, a do-it-yourselfer, <laughs> DIY, then you can um, kind of budget on your own, but yep, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Um, there's a question, can you incorporate living plants into rock riprap? Is that something you that can, can, people do. Uh, there's, <laughs> yes, it can be done. It's, uh, some people like it, some people don't. Um, it's definitely on the list of many tools. Do you have an opinion on that, Tom? Uh, I, I totally agree. Yeah, you can, you can try to plant in between. Otherwise, if you remove a couple rocks and you can break through the fabric, you could maybe squeeze in a bigger tree or something like that, but ample opportunity, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you qualify for a grant, do you relinquish ownership of a portion of your waterfront? No. Um, what we will typically ask is that you sign a agreement that you're going to keep the planting project in place for a certain length of time. Um, and I don't know, Tom, do you know off the top of your head how long the requirement is for Carmar's grant program, for example? I don't. We're just developing, uh, going through phases of kind of creating a plant uh, after the fact, um, um, kind of maintenance uh, grant, um, but nothing, nothing I can speak directly to except echoing that. Yeah, our typical shoreline projects, like if you're voluntarily pursuing a restoration, there's no there's no recording, there's no declaration item that there are unique cases, like if you were tearing out a cabin and rebuilding it, and if there's certain requirements sometimes where you might have to put your shoreline into kind of a, still your property, but just saying it's gonna be maintained as a, a, a natural area with certain aesthetics and, and recreational components, but generally not, yep. Yeah, so you're not, um you know, you're not establishing a conservation easement. You're you're merely getting grant funds in order to restore your shoreline. Um, any kind of size requirements for the size of a lake or size of a shoreline? Well, I can tell you there's no requirements for the size of a lake. Um, but I know that we generally have width recommendations. Lori, what are, what are you typically going with, like in terms of how wide it has to be a buffer planting um, to be worth doing or worth getting a grant for? I mean, four feet starts, but it barely does anything. Four feet, mm -hmm. you know, might, might hold your shore a little, but it's not starting to clean it at all. You're looking at 10 to 15 feet before you're actually getting um, some function back. And then 
think it's, gosh, you could go a hundred feet before you're really getting like a wildlife corridor. So if you've got it, just keep going. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you have regulations, Tom. I feel like there are some minimums for the grant on your end. Yeah, I guess I'll just speak more probably just to, um, again, kind of what I was saying in my presentation components is like, what portion of your lot do you typically want to utilize? Because there's certain requirements. Say if you want to put in a sand blanket and you have a 50 foot lot, well, rules and requirements are only going to allow you a maximum of 25 feet. And then the question becomes like, what's the other 25 feet? And if you can give that back, um, that's a, a good way to think about it. Or if you're in a small lot, um, say you have 50 feet and your neighbor has 50 feet, maybe you guys can kind of combine the same use, like your beaches can overlap, and then you're able to, again, give, give kind of your side components back. So there's a lot of creativity that can happen um, in, in terms of, of the sizing and, and, and all of that too. So. Yeah, and I see, so I see a, a follow-up question was about how does this work in cooperation with a conservation easement? I would talk with whomever, whatever entity is the holder of that conservation easement. If that's, um, for example, Minnesota Land Trust, I know owns a lot of the conservation easements in our area, and it would, you know, just be a matter of checking in. They're going to be supportive of a native shoreline landscape restoration project but just checking in on, you know, to make sure that they know that you're doing it. And if they have any stipulations about how it's done, you could find that out from them. And I always like to add too, you know, if even if you're curious and you wanna start a site visit and just to kind of come up with a concept, it doesn't mean you have to continue forward with implementing or all that. Sometimes it's just good to invite some, some staff out just so, your individual property, every property is unique. So um, there might be nuances and challenges, both with uh, design aspects and, and implementation. So um, never feel like you're obligated to, to continue down, down a path. We'd love it if you did, um, but um, you, you aren't handcuffed by asking us to come out to your site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we hit eight o'clock and I wanna thank Tom and Lori for sharing their expertise with us. It was fun for me because I've sat in on so many of these shoreline presentations and it was fun to see new graphs and new images and just hear um, you know, a new fresh perspective to some of these topics we've been talking about for a while. So look for an email from me tomorrow and I'll make sure that Tom and Lori share with me any resources that they wanna get sent out to the group. And um, yes, and I will also share a link to the Protect Your Shore workshop, which happened last month um, because there was you know, a, a different group of presenters and a little bit uh, different information that was presented at that workshop as well. So yeah, that's a great suggestion. I'll go ahead and send both of those out tomorrow. So wonderful, everybody. Well, enjoy your Monday night. And I guess we didn't get the rain after all. I was so sure it was gonna happen and it turns out we get skunked. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate you.